how are we going to make it practical to manufacture replacement human cells, tissues, and organs is kind of, the answer to that question was, to your point, exactly right. I have in my house a machine shop. I have an electronic shop. That's nowhere near enough to create the real solution, to make it practical to manufacture replacement human cells, cells tissues, and organs. To do that, as you point out, we need government, we need FDA, we need NIST, the National Institutes of Standards, so that we can bring together the resources to scale things up. We need the world of biology at biochemistry, and that we have no internal uh, capability, even though I have a thousand engineers. So given that we knew we're not trying to make a product or even a whole company, we're trying to create a new industry that would be bigger than the semiconductor industry. But even the semiconductor industry grew out of a little science. Bell Labs, how Bardeen, you know, hey, they gave him the Nobel Prize for understanding the physics of material semiconductors. But it took what we call Silicon Valley. It took an entire region of the country to bring together all the resources you need to create an industry. And when you look back at history, that's always true. Detroit is about the automotive industry. They didn't go there because of the weather. They needed iron. They needed coal. Then they needed to figure out how to do castings and forgings and make gears. There was so much that had to come together to make it practical to build what we now take for granted, a very sophisticated automotive industry. In the same way, you look at the Silicon Valley. You got to make wafers. You got to make transistors and integrated circuits, and you need software and hardware and firmware. Well, what do you need to bring together to create an industry that will do for life science what Silicon Valley did for the digital world? Well, you need Regen Valley. You need Carbon Valley, not Silicon Valley. In fact, I'd argue you need a larger and more diverse set of expertise and skill sets. You need all of the engineering skills to manufacture at high volume and high quality but you need the life sciences. You need the recipes for all of these things. And frankly, the recipe to make a transistor or a whole lot of them on a, an array is a lot more straightforward than what it takes to build cells that have rather remarkable capabilities and then build them into entire organs that have even more spectacular capabilities. So what did we do? I couldn't do it in my shop or my basement. The first thing we did when we got an $80 million original grant from the United States government was I set up a not-for-profit 501c3 similar to FIRST. And ironically, I knew the CEOs of a lot of the companies that had the vision and the courage to start FIRST. And they did come from all sorts of industries. I called every one of them and said, we're going to do this again, boys and girls. But this time, I'm going to give you the opportunity to get involved in a not-for-profit that just won't be the ability to build a pipeline for your future company and for your customers' future companies. I'm going to give you the opportunity to be at the epicenter of creating an entire new industry that will be bigger than any industry you've ever seen. You know, you look at this and everybody thinks this is a powerful industry, and yeah, it's changed the world. But these things are commodities at this point. There are a few hundred bucks to get a few billion transistors. You know how many working cells you need in a pancreas? A few billion. Well, what would you pay for one of these? What would you pay for a working pancreas if one of your kids or your siblings or your wife or your mom or your dad needed a kidney or a liver or a lung or a simple pancreas because of diabetes? So we said the largest single health cost of health, uh, the largest single cost in the American economy in the U.S. economy is health care. It's 21% of the GDP now and it's growing faster than any other industry. What if we could create products that instead of chronically treating people, which is where most of that trillion dollars a year goes, I know that I'm in the business. I do very well making dialysis machines. I do very well making insulin pumps. But I've never met a person as proud as I am of my dialysis machines that'll look at me and say, I can't wait until my kidneys fail so I can try your new machine. I never met a kid as cool as my insulin pumps are that can't wait to need to prick his or her finger every three hours and, and give themselves insulin every day. If we could stop the 19th and 20th century model of chronic 
disease treatment, and instead, you got a disease, you got a failed organ, you need a pancreas so you're not diabetic, you need a kidney so you don't need dialysis. What if we could create an industry that can manufacture these organs the way we manufacture electronics and cell phones? If we can do that, we will change quality of life for people. We will give them a cure, not a treatment. They'll all love it. We will bend the cost of health care so that this country won't, as it's doing now, have to make a choice between bankrupting the country or essentially denying a lot of people top quality care. So the long answer to your question, what did we need to do to help create a new industry? This is not an entrepreneurial venture of one guy or one company with a good idea. We have to create an entire baseline of an industry. We have to create the ecosystem and the infrastructure similar to the automotive people 150 years ago or the, the semiconductor people 50 or 60 years ago. We need to build Regen Valley and we need to bring together all the skill sets for design, development, high volume manufacturing and bring it to the world of biology and medicine so that we can take out of the these research universities, the petri dishes, full of the miracle of life. And here they can do, you know, kidneys. And this university, they do livers or lungs. But they're doing it as artisans. They're doing it in a research environment. That's how we think of medicine. We've got to do it in a scaled up environment. And Army, the Advanced Regenerative Manufacturing Institute, is going to do that by bringing together, right now we have over 200 organizations, most of the biggest and most prestigious medical schools in the country are members, most of the biggest and best manufacturing organizations, whether they're aerospace or semiconductor or automotive, they're at the table. We are going to create a whole new industry. It will be the most important new industry that ever emerged in your lifetime. Are we producing the kind of engineers we need? The good news is the answer is we're producing some of them. I think the more terrifying question would be, are we producing enough of the kind of engineers we need? And the answer is no, we're not even close. And when, if you look at the scale of the human population, eight, nine billion, it'll be 10 billion in your lifetime. What percentage of those people will develop the skill sets and resources to become part of the problem solving uh, uh, group? And by the way, disproportionately, why is it that so few young girls and so few kids of various socioeconomic backgrounds even think about developing that muscle hanging between their ears to become the engineers of the future, even though it's obvious to us that the most exciting careers in the next few decades will all be based on understanding science, technology, engineering, math, code, you know, machine learning. Why is it that so many kids don't do it, or worse than that, are steered away from it, or are looking at the stereotypes that make fun of it, or make it seem esoteric, boring, and out of reach? Why is that part of our culture? I don't know. I've been trying to fix that cultural problem for over 30 years with FIRST, and it's working. I've got 81,000 schools. We got well over a million kids, but that's not nearly enough. So, oh, planetary stewardship, what do we need to do? So... As you mentioned, planetary stewardship is going to require a lot of new thinking and application of some old technology in better ways and some new technologies. I am very optimistic that the intersection of the life sciences as we're doing them in Army to make cells, tissues, and organs is also going to be, in fact, it's a lower threshold to use some of those same new technologies to scale up the ability to manufacture food without doing it as inefficiently as building an entire cow to get a few hamburgers out of it, or taking acres and acres of land and millions of gallons of water to end up with relatively small percentages of useful grain. So I think you're gonna see the world of engineering optimize the ability to manufacture various kinds of food, proteins, and, and it will so dramatically reduce the load that this world sees for the demand on space, on square footage, on farms, for uh, uh, water for crops and water for animals. I think there's going to be a huge win there. 
that will make more food available to more people with less impact on the environment. As we start to eliminate stored energy in the form of fossil fuels, um, you start to realize that simple electric cars for short distances might work. What are we going to do for going long distances or across oceans? I think the current battery technologies, even as they're evolving quickly, are not going to meet certain kinds of needs uh, for storing and making use of energy. We're going to need new and better forms of, of, of producing, storing, and moving energy. Our model of the grid needs to be dramatically upgraded if we need a grid at all in the future. Um, I think uh, the biological sciences are going to need to be much more broadly used as part of a way to save the environment than just in the field of medicine. The technologies that we're using to understand how cells divide and how they grow uh, ought to be used in the world of agriculture and animal husbandry. And so we're going to need more and more engineers and more and more scientists, and mostly we're going to need them to learn how to communicate with each other and cooperate with each other because all the really exciting stuff always happens at the intersection of big ideas where some industry has become really good at something that's never been used by some other industry. And then when the new industry sees that and can adopt it, you get an exponential increase in productivity or in the rate of innovation. And we're going to see more and more of that related to the industries uh, that are critical to keeping this world sustainable. Obviously, energy is a, a huge piece of that. Even if you could create a new organ, but if your new organ somehow isn't going to be accepted when you put it into a person who has very sophisticated onboard systems to reject foreign bodies, infections. I'm glad that we have a, you know, an immune response to anything. You give somebody an entire organ, particularly these days, for 50 years, they've been doing transplants of organs like kidneys. And one of the major issues is that organ is going to be rejected. And in fact, even though now we're somewhat successful in giving people organs and they're not rejected, it's because those people for the rest of their life will continue to take things called immunosuppressives to prevent their body from rejecting that organ. But that immunosuppressive is suppressing their whole immune system, so they might not reject that organ, but something that you wouldn't really worry about, like a cold, might be a catastrophe for that person because they can't build antibodies. So one of the reasons we're really excited at Army, our Advanced Regenerative Manufacturing Institute, we're not only going to make an organ, but as imagine, let's say we build the scaffold of an organ. Maybe it's made out of collagen, or maybe it was a decellularized organ from, from some other animal. What if you could take the organ that we happen to know you're going to need in six months? Your doctor told you, we're worried your kidney function is declining, or we're seeing your blood glucose go up. We're worried that your pancreas may be failing. They'd say, okay, we're going to take a few cells from you, and while we're growing a new organ, a scaffold, we're going to take your cells and we're going to put them in one of our army bioreactors and we're going to make a few billion of your cells and we're going to use your cells. We'll turn them into iPSCs, induced pluripotent stem cells. Then we're going to put them in that organ. So when that organ starts to function as that kidney or that liver or that lung, when we put that organ in you, oh, look, it's got your genetics in it. It's not going to be rejected. You're not going to have to take immunosuppressives, which will give you a much better quality of life much less risk of other issues, and by the way, much less cost on an ongoing basis because to have to take immunosuppressors for the rest of your life will bankrupt you. So you didn't ask a secret question at all. We will shout from the rooftop that we love the idea that Army is not only going to make organs, but we're going to custom make organs with your DNA in them. So when we give somebody a new organ, it's like giving them an update on that starter motor or that generator for, for their car, but we got it from the original equipment manufacturer, so we know it's going to fit. We know we don't need adapter plates. We're just going to take your broken down old organ and give you a new one. I think my biggest fear when people make any kind of competition to get kids really excited about technology, the natural thing to do, like any company that's marketing a product, the natural thing to do is go for the low-hanging fruit. 
find the kids most likely to want to participate. And I have to tell you, those are the kids that need this the least. If they've got a mom and dad that are professionals, if they are already at home with the idea that developing that muscle hanging between their ears is critical to their own career and their own future, we don't need to give advantage to the advantaged. To me, the problem is that many girls in particular or socioeconomically isolated kids somehow, even at a very young age, believe science and engineering and mathematics is difficult or boring or not for them. And they'd rather do other things that, that our media says are fun. They all know the superstars in their life are from the NBA or the NFL or from Hollywood. There are a lot of careers in Hollywood or the NBA or the NFL, but where do the kids that, that never even think about science and engineering get meaningful, realistic direction? So no matter whether it's future cities, it doesn't matter what it is, I would ask all the people that are trying to do that to make sure they put extra effort into going after the kids that without them would never do it. The kids that are gonna do it anyway you don't have to worry about them. Don't waste your time. Dear all innovators, sadly, I have only one piece of advice for you. You may not like this advice, but it's the truth. Get used to failing. Failing a lot. Innovation is about doing things that have never been done before. If it's been done before, by definition, it can't be an innovation. If it hasn't been done before, it's for one of at least two reasons. Nobody really wants or needs it. You're gonna find out after you spend a lot of time and energy, you build something that's a solution to a problem nobody has. The other reason that the innovation doesn't exist is because it's really hard. All the easy innovation has been done. You know, we've got fire, we've got the wheel, we've got movable type, we've got the TV clicker, what else do you need? Well, it turns out that if you really wanna to innovate today, you gotta to be standing on the shoulders of a few thousand years of pretty good innovation. So most really big ideas are going to be difficult to do. You'll probably fail along the way. And some people find that difficult. Universities mostly are here to teach you how to not fail. They give you textbooks where all the answers are already there. They're in the back of the book. You get used to that. In fact, you get graded. If you didn't get that right answer, you get a red bar. Well, when you go out to innovate, there's no answers in the back of the book. And so it's really hard. And most people that have done very well in school aren't used to getting red marks and failing. I would say to all of you entrepreneurs and all of you innovators, you got to stop thinking that there's a short, direct path to get to the right answer and get an A+. You're going to fall down many times. Success comes when you can fall down seven times and stand up eight. And if you can do that and learn from it and move on, hopefully you'll end up being a great innovator. If you can't get comfortable doing that, go work for the phone company. I am not sure that robotics per se is going to be the focal point of a major industrial change specifically to deal with the environmental issues the world has. It'll have a lot of other powerful applications and we'll do a lot with robotics that people don't appreciate right now that will improve all sorts of things our medical capability transport i mean manufacturing quality lots of things but i'm not sure that if you if you wanted to pick a particular industry that is likely to have a major impact on global environmental issues i think i'd stay with energy production storage, transmission, conversion. There's a lot of major technical innovations that need to happen that are related to the environment. Food production, water production. There's a lot of technologies, a lot in chemistry, carbon capture, carbon sequestration. There's a lot of that that I'm not sure that, that robotics would be at the, that, at the center of any of those innovations.